Under the Controlled Substances Act and Corollary State Law, the growth, trafficking, sale, possession, or consumption of psychedelics may be a felony punishable by imprisonment, fines, forfeiture of property, or some combination thereof. Psychedelical X is for general information only. Information provided on the show does not constitute legal advice, nor does your listening to the show create an attorney-client relationship with the host. Hello, I'm attorney Gary Smith, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Psychedelic Alex, The Law of Psychedelics, my ongoing exploration of the question of the law of psychedelics. All right, so uh, three, two, one, we're officially on. Okay, so I want to welcome to the show fellow attorney Greg Lake, and Greg operates in the entheogenic law space uh, more intensely than I do, in fact, and, and Greg and I met, oh, what, roughly about a year ago, would you say? Uh, Approximately. On, online, just uh, courtesy of the damn pandemic. Uh, mm-hmm. I was posting a bunch of stuff in social media, and I encountered Greg and discovered he was doing the same, and it turned out... Uh, we had aligned interests. We were both kind of chasing after the same dream of liberating psychedelics from the prison that it's locked in. Yeah. Fair summary? <laughs> yeah, no, very fair summary. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that, that hits the nail on the head. Perfect. Uh, now, I know a little bit about your personal story because you, you're actually very uh, open and generous in sharing mm-hmm. y- your personal life and, and all that you've gone through that led you to oh. this entheogenic mm-hmm. space. Are, are you comfortable talking about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You want me to kind of give a background into how I ended up uh, in the space? Yeah, a- absolutely. And by the way, uh, do not be shy about plugging yourself, your services or your law firm. That's, that's oh, oh, part yeah, of this yeah, as well. Yeah. So cool. So yeah, I am. Um, I grew up uh, in Northeast Texas, a town just uh, right across the border from Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, had a good idyllic childhood. Um, but <clears throat> for whatever reason, I started using drugs and drinking at a very early age, probably around 12. Um, but through that, I was a very functional, highly functional addict and was able to, you know, graduate high school, go to college, go to law school, pass the bar, um, in Texas originally. And so my, uh, my, my mother, unfortunately passed away from a heart attack my second year in law school Mm -hmm. and kind of kicked in, uh, my addiction into overdrive, particularly with opiates. And so, um, I was able to scratch through my last year of law school, able to scratch through the Texas bar, but not too long after that, my, my addiction kind of took over and I wasn't really able to practice law anymore. Um, I made that personal decision after a while and <clears throat> had a few misdemeanor arrests and kind of came to a head and decided to get treatment and um, pick the hardest place in America to go to. It, uh, it was a Cinecor, it's a therapeutic community. Um, 31 months in there I did. And, um, you know, it got me straight. Um, and, and I guess I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. You know, I had used entheogens randomly throughout my addiction, sort of towards the end of my addiction. I actually kind of built a, a good relationship with the psilocybin mushrooms, um, which, you know, at that time I started to realize the concept of mystical states of consciousness, uh, receiving profound insights, things like that. I, I started to notice that this has more than just a mere recreational value to it. Like these are, you know, trying to tell me something, you know, and, uh, and usually it was, you're an addict, you're never going to go anywhere like this, you know, you're way better than this, things of that nature. And um, so when I, you know, uh, got out of rehab, this was in 2018, um, started working a little bit more with the medicine. And one thing led to another. And when the pandemic hit, uh, I had been looking at all of the psilocybin research. Whenever I got out of Cinecor, I was able to have a phone again and was doing, you know, just research and saw all the psilocybin stuff coming out, which really intrigued me and really resonated with me because it it basically solidified what I had already kind of known about it. You know, mystical states that could help with addiction and overcome these other troubles uh, that we all face from time to time. And um just got motivated spiritually to write my first book that was basically a compilation of all the research up through February 2020. Um, Then soon after that, I was approached um, to 
I, or asked about what I knew about the law surrounding and theogenic churches and religions in the United States, particularly uh, as it pertains to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And admittedly, at the time, I didn't. Um, my primary practice now is maritime law, and we do a lot of legal research and writing in, in the space. And so I'd been doing a lot of legal research and writing, and I remember I picked up both the UDV and Santo Dime cases and was just completely intrigued. Uh, I was unaware of this at the time, right? And so uh, that kind of started my fascination into that space and just started doing a lot of deep research and reading and, and stuff and started helping people uh, advise them on setting up these churches. Uh, and, you know, I just kept doing project after project after project. And then I, I published my second book of the law of entheogenic churches in the United States, which is more or less a breakdown of RIFRA in light of uh, the UDV and Santo Dame opinions. Yes, that's it. Hey, let me let me just put um, this up close to the yeah, yeah, camera because uh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> and yeah, this is available now on Amazon, kids. Don't be yes, shy. Yes, it is. It is, yeah. And so, um, yeah, so I published that book around the first of this last year, and uh, it's helped a lot of people. You know, I, I think there's a lot of people that were practicing underground, you know, that you know, they, they read it and they just feel a little bit better and a little bit more protected about their practice. And, and from what I understand, you know, people who feel a little bit better and more protected are able to have people who come to their ceremonies feel a little bit better and more protected. And they're able to relax and, and get more out of the experience. For right. Sure, for so, sure. But, you know, we're, we're all me, you and all the other attorneys in this space on this side of the the mark, you know, we're all pushing to try to kind of broaden that and and, and expand the protections, right? And, and then other areas, you know, and just real quick, I see it kind of as the research, decrim, and religious fronts all working in tandem to kind of change the general public attitudes towards these substances. I've kind of geared now towards the religious side of it. Uh, so but that's where I am. And, and just so you know, I'm currently working on my third book, which is going to really examine what constitutes a religion in the United States, right? So <clears throat> with an eye towards, you know, since I've been in this space working with these different groups, kind of the atypical, uh, prototypical group, you know, what does the case law over time kind of say about whether this is religious or not? And, and then, you know, what could we do to help maybe meet that mark uh, in the future? And, and it's also in light of the Soul Quest letter, too as you very well know. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, a couple episodes back of the show, I, I did a review of that DEA denial. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And in a weird way, DEA kind of did everybody a nice favor. I, I know they weren't they intending to, but yeah. they gave you the roadmap on how they think. So, so yeah. you know, it's not difficult to follow. And I'll, I'll give you a little uh, heads up. Um, in wake of that uh, episode, I was asked to author an article and follow up. So mm -hmm. there's about a 2,500 word article, I think going okay. to be published next week uh, that I wrote on this uh, and it'll be on psychedelics today. Awesome. Um, and, and it's me just sort of summarizing that episode and also uh, pointing out what I think the major flaw is in DEA's current mode. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, I'll be glad when it comes out and, and I'll cite to it uh, in, in my book. Uh, Cause I want to get everybody's viewpoints in there and just kind of, but, but I think the consensus among us is that the DEA pretty much overstepped yeah. uh, their, their boundaries in this area. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the little subheadings inside my article I <laughs> titled, uh, DEA installed its RIFRA filter backwards. And, <laughs> and what I mean by that is simply that it thinks it's in the role of actually evaluating mm -hmm. religion yeah. and evaluating sincerity of religious yeah. practice. Uh, and that, no offense to DEA, creeps me out how is a yeah. police agency really no. possessed of the belief let alone the actual authority uh to determine what is religion in the united states that to me is so abhorrent to the first amendment i don't see how they survive that if somebody gets a good challenge up in front of the supreme court so i and it's you know it's funny you say that i've read probably over the last week 20 you know, First Amendment cases, uh, just trying to get this bill for what is religion. And I mean, every single case, the court starts with a laundry list of disclaimers before they even touch the issue that this is a delicate issue. 
we need to remove all of our preconceived notions of what's religion and, and judge this. You know, obviously there's some objective standards that we look at, but we have to realize that this thing is not uh, static in nature. It is dynamic. New groups appear. And I feel like when I read the Soul Quest letter, there's definitely a Judeo-Christian or or some type of lens that they're looking through mm. that's not as expansive as what the courts who have proper jurisdiction over these issues uh, would would view that. Yeah, I, you know, I'm so glad you said that. I absolutely picked up on that as well. I made a deliberate choice to kind of shy away from going there in, in my mm-hmm. article. Yeah. Um, but for sure, there is definitely some sort of a Judeo-Christian bias. It doesn't come as a surprise. Um, no. Let's be honest, it's the dominant religion in the U.S., so it's going to be yes. something you're going to bang into. But I think it's also a byproduct of the fact that the DEA doesn't have any um, religiously trained people on its staff. They yeah. don't, they don't have... Right anybody with those degrees. I mean, you're running into field agents who know how to do accounting and shoot guns. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and uh, I was going to let you know real quick, I've actually, uh, I say partnered, but I've been in contact with Dr. Martin Ball, who's obviously a uh, doctorate in, in uh, religion and a very experienced 5-MEO practitioner. My understanding is back when 5-MEO was, was legal, he, he guided a lot of people through that experience. So he's agreed to kind of consult me on this and uh, provide me with some historical and cross-cultural references is, is also with, uh, you know, his insights into these experiences <clears throat> to help me kind of make the best case um, for, you know, protection, you know, religion definition uh, in my book. Cool. Awesome. Um so let, let's talk about the uh, the indicia of religion as as uh, U.S. law currently sees it, and like sort of compare and contrast where we think it should go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, amongst things that I know from reading cases like the Africa case, uh, mm-hmm. you know, this, the courts are looking for uh, you know, questioning questioning of imponderables, some mm-hmm. sort of a credo or or. or ethos. Uh, I think they'd prefer it be written, even though there are tons of religions that don't write anything down. Uh, right. But having stuff in writing helps. Uh, you know, on, on the entheogenic part of this, um, that entheogen's got to be at the heart of the religion. It's got to be a sacrament. It can't just be frivolous or incidental. Um, let's see, having some sort of a corporate structure probably helps because it tends to at least demonstrate some seriousness to the cause. Um, storing your entheogens, keeping them locked up, restricting access, uh, limiting them really only to bona fide ritual during mm-hmm. a ceremony, not just mm-hmm. handing it out and letting people go home with it. That, that kind of stuff is, I think, what the courts are going to be looking for. Yeah, and so like on the belief side, you're right. It's like these, does these, do these experiences address like ultimate ideas? Does it address a alternate reality or dimension um, and let's stop there for a second. You know, I, I started reading back uh, some of the early, early research from the people who, you know, were observing people, you know, consuming entheogens and observing and taking notes. And I mean, the consensus is, is that for the most part in the proper set and setting and context, these effectuate primary religious experiences, which is one's own personal contact with the divine. Right. So oh, for sure. Um, yeah, that's kind of my base pillar right there now, you know, but that that's obviously not going to be the do all end all. But again, they also look like, is there some type of moral code or what's right and wrong? And from what I've noticed working with, um, you know, all these different groups is that there's probably about 10 or 12 and I've actually reduced them to writing. There's about 10 or 12 beliefs and tenets, right? that kind of transcend almost everyone's experience uh, in this realm. And so what I'm going to do with the book is since I've gotten enough consensus on these, I'm going to use that as kind of a hypothetical uh, to run through the gauntlet after I lay out all the case law um, and, and compare those. But yeah, so that kind of takes care of that. Uh, But then kind of like what you went to is that there's also these outward indicia that the court can look at that can also you know, kind of hammer home the point that this is, you know, religious in nature. And, and as we know, a lot of these groups are starting and, in, 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 you know, my, you know, direction to file for nonprofit churches. Um, some some want to file for 501c3 status, but it's not necessary with 508c1a. But, you know, to have a church, uh, to have people 
uh, involved, board of directors, things of that nature. You know, there's this issue of some have their separate, you know, church government versus this. I've never really hammered home that's necessarily required, but, you know, at least have board of directors that's actively involved in kind of managing uh, the affairs of the church. And then, you know, I think it boils down to this real simple is that are we getting together for a sacred ceremony for the purpose of effectuating primary religious experiences? Um, are we doing so safely? Are we doing proper screening? Uh, and do we have enough people at the ceremony to kind of make sure that everyone's going to be okay and have some emergency procedures? Uh, and then like the three is that storing and handling these substances, right? Um, according with when, after I read the UDV and Santo Dime, to me, that kind of means that we've only denoted one to three people higher up in the church structure uh, that are able to handle or store these sacraments, right? Preferably behind three locks uh, and preferably with some type of, type of record keeping system. To me, that's kind of the bare bones of something that's getting towards the protected end uh, of, of this, this test that's been laid out, you know, in the religious yeah. and restoration act. For sure. You know, and on that point, the advice I typically uh, tell people is you want to have your church relative to how it handles the entheogens behave like a pharmacy or a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. You know, how would your pharmacist deal with these things? Well, they'd be behind a counter, behind a lock. Uh, If they're schedule one or two, they're going to be behind yet an additional lock, maybe a safe. Uh, Most Mm -hmm. people don't know this, but cocaine, for example, schedule two, not schedule one. You can actually get well, you can't get cocaine, I can't get cocaine, but, you know, uh, there are physicians and, and pharmacists who can prescribe it, and it is actually mm-hmm. legitimately used in Western medicine, typically as an anesthetic. So if you're at the right pharmacy, they will have a safe in the back with cocaine in it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, um, and that's the thing is that we have to realize that, you know, the DEA does have authority to regulate these substances, right? And yeah. normally they are in the medical context, and so you know, what's religious in our religion kind of has to be separated out from how we treat these sacraments, right? We have to kind of abide by some rules and guidelines because it's the public health and safety, uh, the compelling governmental interests argument, right? That's yep. part of the equation. Right so at the heart of reference. You know, and, and I get it. I don't, I don't, look, I don't disagree with that at all. I, I think my view is that these substances are probably safer than what the government obviously would argue or believe. Uh, but that's neither here nor there, right? We have to respect, you know, where they're at, congressional findings, things of that nature, um, and and just try to do the best we can to appease the court that these things are being handled properly. Yeah, a- a- absolutely, totally agree. Like people are shocked when I say that I'm not anti DEA, and I'm not, not yeah. by any stretch. I think DEA has a very vital and important role to play, uh, both on a police side of things. Um, you know, look, they're going after cartels. That's fine. We can have a conversation about whether cartels should or shouldn't exist or what they're doing should or shouldn't happen, but that's what they do. And I think also DEA helps with consumer protection. You know, to, to a degree, they're making sure that you're not getting tainted goods. Um, unfortunately, they go a little overboard and they're making sure you're not getting any goods, but yeah. <laughs> at least you're not getting the tainted ones. So I, I'm by no means anti-DEA. I just think that as, as a sub-agency of an agency of the executive branch, they just need to get a, a more updated set of instruction on how to go about their function. Um, and it's not a difficult thing for them to adjust to. You know, I, I want to say this, that when you had your talk with Charles Carry on, you made a proposal which really struck me about how the DEA should go about regulating this, about, you know, people filing an affidavit. Or I, some I put that in my article, by the way. So you'll see that. Yeah, right. I think that's a very good idea. And I can't put my finger on it now, but I think I found some case law uh, for such a system, and, and if I can find it again, I'll, I'll let you know. And oh, it. But for I sure, that, uh, tell you what, if you, you know, if you dig fine. it up, why don't we collaborate? We'll do an article yeah, or, or a I think there's shoot here in on another this. context that you know the court has suggested that well, you could simply have people file some type of document stating that this is their sincere religious belief and practice. Right? Yeah, so, for for sure, and for the audience's sake, uh, to bring you fully into what. Greg and I are talking about, the comment I made during my SoulQuest episode was that at the same time that I think DEA oversteps by digging into your religion and your supposed sincerity, um, again, DEA does have a role to play if we're talking about importation of a Schedule One. but I think because of First Amendment being a fundamental right of religious belief, meaning we don't get the right of religious freedom from our government, rather the First Amendment 
is the government's promise back to us that it will never intrude on that fundamental right, meaning that that fundamental right is older than and supreme to the United States itself. It existed before nationhood. All we do in the First Amendment is acknowledge that. So from that place, when the DEA is asking these questions, I think that all they should do is ask for an attestation, where if you're an importer, for example, you would sign a simple document identifying yourself, what you're importing, and it'll say something like, you're having it for this religious purpose, your belief is sincere, period. Sign it, hand it over. And then at that point, if DEA has serious misgivings, it can go up to its parent, the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, and let it decide what it's gonna do. But in the meantime, it being the DEA, should not be deciding this and should be releasing your sacrament to you. And you've given them your information. They know where to find you. So look, if it turns out you're not who you said you were and you're not doing the thing you said you were going to do, fine, you get in trouble and you probably deserve it. And the bonus for the DEA here is you've signed an attestation under oath, which means you get a bonus felony for perjury for being that guy who lied. I think it's simple, it's clean, and it gets everybody what they need. It allows DEA to perform its function, it can track you, and it can still charge you if you're not being up and up. The religion gets to perform as the religion intends, First Amendment rights intact, and USDOJ or any local police agency, if it's feeling vexatious, it can do what it wants. Oh, I agree. And, and I'll just tell you kind of from my perspective, I think you asked me about this the other day, and I, and I can't really seem to put an approximate number of groups that are operating uh, in the U.S., but in the event that this, you know, religious exemption kind of gets broadened out, it, it's going to be so many groups that really, in, you know, qualify under the exemption that the DA is going to need to do something. They're, they're not going to be able to do like this formal process or guidance document that they had up there. There's no way they would ever be able to process that many applications. And, and certainly litigating every single one of these cases is, I mean, just a bad deal for everyone involved. So hmm. you know, what you propose, I think, is a good middle ground to kind of because here you have the problem in the cases always stay is that fraudulent claims. You know what I mean? People claiming fraudulently that this is their religious belief and practice in order to skip out on obligations, acquire certain benefits, things of that nature. Um, but again, when you're signing something under oath, you're announcing to the government what you're doing. They then have carte blanche, if they have some misgivings about it, to then pick those cases that they feel might be fraudulent. Yeah, for sure. You know, I was talking with a, a I won't name him because I don't want to <laughs> reveal somebody without permission. But I was talking with a, a fellow legal practitioner in this space earlier this morning on this exact topic. And um, one of the things he said to me, which I hadn't thought about before, but man, it just boop, turned a light bulb on in my head, was that all of these psychedelic churches should come out of hiding and mm-hmm. make themselves known. Because the more that shows up, the harder it becomes for DEA to enforce, just like you right. said. Um, and, and it's not from the perspective of trying to thwart the DEA, but just to demonstrate that this is not as, as non-mainstream or rare or arcane as people think it is. I am perpetually shocked at the number of psychedelic religious groups around the country. And, you know, I kind of practice in this space, and I encounter a new one weekly that I've never heard of. I'll just randomly talk to people, and they'll be like, hey, have you heard of so-and-so? And I'm like, uh, no, tell me more. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's it's really shocking. I would love to get a semi-accurate or accurate census figure on this because I think it's way bigger than anybody thinks. Well, and one other thing, too, that I would like to see by this happening is is there's a really good research grounds uh, at, at these uh, churches. Oh, know? for sure. Uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I've been in talks with some different departments or people who have been in talks with departments of universities like, you know, I've offered to help set up, uh, you know, uh, surveys or whatever to try to help them get some data points uh, from these places, because uh, I think those numbers help also boost the protect or presumably would help boost the protection, you know, like to show why are people coming? What kind of experiences are they having? What kind of results are they seeing? You know, things of that nature. Oh, yeah, a- absolutely. Uh, I would love to see more of that because the, the more this becomes mainstream and the more people stop treating it like a taboo, 
it will eventually stop being a taboo. It's just, exactly, it's just that simple, exactly. folks. You got to talk about it, uh, which is in part why I kind of came out as psychedelic lawyer. I mean, I, I took mm-hmm. a career risk doing this. Yeah. Yep. But, uh, you know, fortunately, I'm 30 years in. I, I'm, what, maybe five or 10 years left of my uh, career before I hang up my guns. Um, so it was the point in time to take the risk. Yeah. Uh, and, and I will You're say. You're Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe. Agitation. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will say, not only has coming out not hurt me, my street cred has shot through the <laughs> roof. I, yeah. I mean, people who, like, yeah. never in a million years would you think looking at them that they are involved in or no psychedelics and man, I'm shocked. People come out to me all the time now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to name names. I would never betray mm-hmm. a trust, but for mm-hmm. folks at home, people at all echelons of society, people you mm-hmm. would never think would be involved with psychedelics are absolutely 100% involved with them. And even people you do know <laughs> for sure. It's, it's funny you say that, uh, the other day, my law partner and I were approached by a person with some pretty well, pretty good notoriety uh, and actually kind of in this space um, who is backing uh, a church uh, to be established with, with a cool lineage, man, a real cool South American Wachuna lineage. And um, it, uh, yeah, I mean, there, it's it's going to be pushed further and further out and people are going to realize it. And that's one thing that I like about the religious end so much is because I feel it has potentially a greater impact on the collective because the number of people coming in and out of these ceremonies, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, every, every weekend um, and then going out into the world and showing and reflecting positive change and vibrations and energy out there, I feel has the potential to have the widest impact right now. Uh, but obviously, as these decriminalization measures, which I support and help, yeah. um, you know, get get more and more prolific, that'll be another force to be reckoned with. And then obviously, once the, the psilocybin comes to market, uh, that'll be another uh, one in there. Yeah, for sure. And, and I totally agree that the, the people who come to these churches and have these experiences are absolutely the best advocates for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you don't need billboards. You just need experience. No. Uh, let me ask you this, how, I'm not even sure how to word this, but how many people or what percentage do you find are like one-time visitors only and they don't come back versus the people who are return and repeat and part of an established congregation? You know, I, I think what I've been, probably anywhere from 30 to 50% would be regular or semi-regulars to ceremonies at a given church. And, and, and I'll tell you this too. A lot of the places I work would do more than just sacred medicine ceremonies. They do music workshops, rap ceremony. You know, there, there's a whole mix of events that they have going on, men's circles, integration events. And yeah. here in a minute, I'll tell you what my theory is about the integration. But, um, yeah, so there's all kinds of events. But I would say as far as, like, it, at, at the medicine uh, or, or at the uh, their, their sacred ceremonies, probably 30 to 50 percent, you know, um, and a lot of people that I work with think that, oh, well, I'm going to have to kind of put myself out there on Facebook or these other places to like get people in. But what I've been noticing is that if they're doing really good work, if they throw about three or four good ceremonies or conduct three or four good ceremonies and get an email list going, that's all the reach that they're going to need because eventually those people tell people and, and you get your group. And, and I'll say this. I've noticed personally that when I go to a ceremony where there's 30 to 50 percent regulars, it's such great energy uh, at the ceremony, man. It's just that connectedness between them kind of lifts all the other people just coming in for the first time up. Absolutely. Just take the Native American church as the example. Oh, my Mm -hmm. God. Over 200,000 members, active members. Mm -hmm. Not everybody does the peyote ceremony every time, but they're active members. Uh, and it's mostly group ritual. Oh, hang on. My cat has decided to join us. Uh, stand by. Yeah. Oh, Brutus. Always, always during a show. Oh, come on, buddy. Get out. Come here. Come here. All right. Listen, I'm good. For the sake of the show, because people hear this little monster yeah. Yeah. meowing outside the door all the time. Let's sit here and behave. Okay. Let's, let's try the show with the cat. All right. Cool. I like the cat. He's cute. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you too. This is this is Brutus, and two weeks ago we had to put his sister down. They're uh, 15 oh, years man. old litter mates. We've had them since they uh, were weaned. 
Uh, so he's been having a real tough time, as have yeah. we. We really miss his sister a bunch. So yeah. um, he's been needing a lot of extra attention. So yeah, I'll see if it. he'll be a good participant today. But folks yeah, who watch the show good. have asked to see him. So this this is actually Brutus. He is a real cat. <laughs> All right. Stop talking. Just sit there. Yeah, anyway, what I was going to ultimately lead to on the how many people are, are repeat versus just single visits, mm-hmm. one of my concerns that could come up in one of these cases is that mm-hmm. fact that there are so many one-timers. Because, uh, you know, tying back to the comment at the beginning of our discussion about people looking at a Judeo-Christian model and expecting every religion to look like that, you know, you show up regularly every week for a church service, that's not how this necessarily works in the yeah. psychedelic religions or in the entheogenic religions. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that there's uh, enough record developed in these cases that that comes yeah. across crystal clear to the courts. Well, here, here's kind of my response to that. One is this, is that I can't tell you, you know, I grew up in a Judeo-Christian background and, and growing up, I can't tell you how many churches I went to for one service and never to be seen again. Now, granted, but those churches do have a regular membership and that's fine. And then two, I would say, you know, the nature of these experiences is so profound that um, I don't think it should be encouraged that people show up every weekend and and commune, right? I mean, I think yeah. these people need to take some time to themselves, be part of integration groups or one-on-one integration sessions uh, to try and make sense of these things. And, and this leads to a really good point is that, you know, these are primary religious experience, presumably, if done properly, right? Well, when I go to, and, and this is not a comment on the validity or anything about any other religions, but for most other religions, you know, you go there on a certain day of the week, you have a guy who's reading or a girl uh, who's reading, you know, 2000 year old primary religious experiences and his. Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them. Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community. Thank you.